Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read Dream Days by Kenneth Graham. So, let's get going. The idea of my fine big soldiers being told off to carry things. I was not inclined to tell her any more, though there, was, there still remained plenty more to tell. Are any other boys there? she asked presently in a casual sort of way. Oh yes, I unguardedly replied. Nice chaps too. We'll have great... Then I re recollected myself. We'll play with them, of course, I went on. But you are going to be my friend, aren't you? And you'll come in my boat and we'll travel in the guard's van together and I'll stop the soldiers firing off their guns. But she looked mischievously away and, do what I would, I could not get her to promise. Just then the striking of the village clock awoke within me, another clamorous timepiece, reminding me of my midday mutton a good half mile away, and of penalties and curtailments attached to a late appearance. We took a hurried farewell of each other, and before we parted I got from her an admission that she might be gardening again that afternoon, if only the worms would be less aggressive and give her a chance. Remember, I said as I turned to go, you mustn't tell anybody about what I've been telling you. She appeared to hesitate, swinging one leg to and fro while she regarded me, sideways with half-shut eyes. It's a dead secret, I said artfully, a secret between us two, and nobody knows it except ourselves. Then she promised, nodding violently, big-eyed, her mouth pursed up small. The delight of revelation and the bliss of possessing a secret run each other very close, but the latter generally wins, for a time. I had passed the mutton stage and was weltering in warm rice pudding before I found leisure to pause and take in things generally, and then a glance in the direction of the window told me, to my dismay, that it was raining hard. This was anno annoying in every way, for even if it cleared up later, the worms, I knew well from experience, would be offensively numerous and frisky. Sulkily, I said grace and accompanied the others upstairs to the schoolroom, where I got out my paint box and resolved to devote myself seriously to art, which of late I had much neglected. Harold got hold of a sheet of paper and a pencil, retired to a table in the corner, squared his elbows and produced, protruded his tongue. Literature had always been his form of artistic expression. Selina had a fit of the fidgets, bred of the uncompromising weather, and, instead of settling down to something on her own account, must needs walk round and annoy us artists, intent on embodying our conceptions of the ideal. She had been looking over my shoulder some minutes before I knew of it, or I would have had a word or two to say upon the subject. "'I suppose you call that thing a ship,' she remarked contemptuously. "'Who ever heard of a pink ship, hoo-hoo?' I stifled my wrath, knowing that in order to score properly, it was necessary to keep a cool head. There is a pink ship, I observed with forced calmness, lying in the toy shop window now. You can go and look at it if you like. Do you know? Do you suppose you know more about ships than the fellows who make them? Selina, baffled for the for the moment, returned to the charge presently. Those are funny things too, she observed. Suppose they're meant to be trees, but they're blue. They are trees, I replied with severity, and they are blue. They've got to be blue, because you stole my gamboge last week, so I can't mix up any green. Didn't steal your gamboge, declared Selina haughtily, edging away, however in the direction of Harold. And I wouldn't tell lies either if I was you about a d dirty little bit of gamboge. I preserved a discreet silence. After all, I knew she knew she stole my gamboge. The moment Harold became conscious of Selina's stealthy approach, he dropped his pencil and flung himself flat upon the table, protecting thus his literary efforts from chilling criticism by the interposed thickness of his person. From somewhere in his interior proceeded a heart-rending compound of squeal and whistle, as of escaping steam. Long-drawn, ear-piercing, unvarying in note. 
I only just want to see, protested Selina, struggling to uproot his small body from the scrawl it guarded. But Harold clung limpet-like to the table edge, and his shrill protest continued to deafen humanity and to threaten even the serenities of Olympus. The time seemed come for a demonstration in force. Personally, I cared little what soul outpourings of Harold were pirated by Selina. She was pretty sure to get hold of them sooner or later, and indeed I rather welcomed the diversion as favourable to the undisturbed pursuit of art. But the, clash, uh, the clannishness of sex has its unwritten laws. Boys as such are sufficiently put upon, maltreated trodden under as it is. Should they fail to hang together in perilous times, what disasters, what ignominities, sorry, ignominies, may not be looked for, possibly even an extinction of the tribe. I dropped my paintbrush and sailed shouting into the fray. The result was a short space hung dubious. There is a period of life when the difference of a year or two in age far outweighs the minor advantages of sex. Then the gathers of Selina's frock came away with a sound like the rattle of distant musketry, and the, this calamity it was, rather than mere brute compulsion, that quelled her indomitable spirit. The female tongue is mightier than the sword, as soon as I, as I soon had good reason to know, when Selina, her riven garment held out at length, avenged her discomfiture with the Greek fire of personalities and abuse. Every black incident in my short but not stainless career, every error, every folly, every penalty ignobly suffered, were paraded before me as in a magic lantern show. The information, however, was not particularly new to me, and the effect was staled by previous rehearsals. Besides, a victory remains a victory, whatever the moral character of the triumphant, triumphant general. Harold chuckled and crowed as she dropped from the table, revealing the document over which so many gathers had cited, sighed their short lives out. You can read it if you like, he said to me, gratefully. It's only a death letter. It had never been possible to say what Harold's particular amusement of the hour might turn out to be. One thing only was certain, that it would be something improbable, unguessable, not to be foretold. Who, for instance, in search of rel relaxation, would ever dream of choosing the drawing up of a tes testamentary di dis disposition of property? Yet this was the form taken by Harold's latest craze, and in justice this much had to be said for him, that in the christening of his amusement he had gone right to the heart of the matter. <coughs> the words will and testament have various meanings and uses, but about the signification of death letter there can be no manner of doubt. I smoothed out the crumpled paper and read, in actual form it deviated considerably from that usually adopted by family solicitors of standing, the only resemblance, indeed, lying in the absence of punctuation. My dear Edward, it ran, when I die I leave all my money to, to you, my walking sticks, whips, my crop, my sword, and gun bricks, forts, and all things I have good I have. Goodbye, my dear Charlotte. When I die, I leave you my watch and compass and pencil case, my sailors and camper down, my pictures and everything. Goodbye, your loving brother. Amen, my dear Martha. I love you very much. I leave you my garden, my mice and rabbits, my plants in pots when I die. Please take care of them, my dear. Coetera descent. I don't know what that last bit is. Why, you're not leaving me anything, exclaimed Selina indignantly. You're a regular mean little boy, and I'll take back the last birthday present I gave you. I don't care, said Harold, repossessing himself of the document. I was going to leave you something, but I shan't now, because you tried to read my death letter before I was dead. Then I'll write a death letter myself, retorted Selina, scenting an artistic vengeance, and I shan't leave you a single thing and she went off in search of a pencil. And with that, we come to the end of the episode. So, I will say thank you very much for joining me today. 
I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.